I'd like to invite our next panellists onto the uh, stage, if they wouldn't mind joining me, please. Um, I'd like to introduce them to you. Uh, you can find out more detailed biographies of them uh, in the Probat app. But they include Holger Preibisch, who's CEO of the German Coffee Association, Rick Reinhardt, Executive Director of the Specialty Coffee Association, and Bill Murray, President of the National Coffee Association, uh, National Coffee Association in the US. This session will last approximately 45 minutes, and we're going to discuss global regulatory developments. Welcome. So, gentlemen, um, I guess we ought to start out by defining what we mean by regulation and uh, who the regulators are. And I know that, Holger, you have some views on this that you wanted to put across. <coughs> Thanks a lot, uh, David. Um, when we think of uh, regulation, uh, firstly we assume the law or the governmental regulation. But uh, as long as you are not affected by Proposition 65 in the US, most times not this kind of regulation keeps you up at night. Most times it's uh, others, uh, other factors which uh, drives you mad. That's uh, when uh, your clients uh, raises uh, the specification uh, for your particular product. This is also to, in these days uh, regulation because it's written in the contract requirements you have to fulfill. Uh, then uh, you are always uh, kind of nervous uh, what's going on on social media, uh, the NGOs uh, starting campaigns. And uh, this is also in these days an, an unbalanced uh, power. Uh, we see it in Germany, uh, if you compare uh, how many people are working for a political, political party, uh, for the big political parties uh, working around 100 people. For uh, each NGO in, in Germany, for the biggest one, working 200. So the NGOs in these days are really powerful and uh, they are very experienced to simplify any problem we are facing in the industry and uh, they pretend to have a very easy solution, which is never. We see it uh, on, on different uh, topics like uh, the, the capsule, what's the best material. We see it in the single use cups, coffee to go. They don't ask for any uh, ecological footprint. How many times you need to use the to go cup? Uh, is it uh, more eco friendly to use it five times compared to the reusable? They don't have data, they don't uh, have facts, but they claim this is the easier solution. So even if the law is kind of liberal, the industry is facing very tough requirements by the clients, by the NGO. Um, what we don't see in, in these days is that uh, the self-regulation by the market was working. That's very interesting. I was uh, really impressed listening to the presentation uh, by Starbucks given what, what you have done uh, in, in, in the farming. But I, I really wonder if the consumer appreciates this. Is this a value that the consumer pays more to it? Um, and we can start it ourselves. Do we care about the working conditions of people somewhere else? If I ask, just ask on this stage, do we know in what country, under what conditions our shirt is produced? Tough questions, probably not, me either. So yes, we are all interested, where does it come from, what are the conditions, but uh, the requirements on the self-regulating market doesn't work. Um, so we need sometimes not only the, not only the NGO, not only uh, the, the, the customer, the consumer, we need sometimes the law uh, because ethical questions are not self-regulating on the market. Mm -hmm. So th these are the four requirements or regulations I see uh, affecting the industry. Bill, what's your take on the US market in particular, and regulation and who the regulators are, who's affecting our industry? You know, I think uh, one of the first questions, and, and you're really getting to this, what exactly is regulation? Why are we here? I think it's absolutely fascinating that we're here having this discussion right now. You think about Probot, you talked about having tier one customers here. None of us are your customers. And I think it's a reflection of the vision of your company and why you're, why you're so successful that you've got people up here to talk about regulation, a subject that most people would run from the room screaming to get away from. 
So the first question really is, what is regulation and why should you care? We often talk about oh, the companies that we work with, the people that we work with as a family, as Vim did earlier. But we also talk about each other as teammates. If you think about a, a team, you're on a pitch, and you think that you have two choices. The first choice is that you follow the rules. The second choice is that you break the rules. You get a red card, and you get taken out of the game. But there's a third choice, and that choice is you change the rules. You participate in the process. You look at the regulations, the laws. You speak up. You make your voice heard. And I think that's why we're here today, because the question of industry engagement at a moment when there's more hysteria, more social media, more drama than ever before, it's never been more important for industry to step up and participate. The fact is regulation is sort of an intersection between politics and law, between politics and science. Unfortunately, when you mix the two of these, when you mix politics and science, you get politics. When you mix politics and law, you get politics. It's as if you had two glasses of water. One was clear and one was dirty. And you mix them together, you get dirty water. So the fact is the regulatory environment is more politicized, mm -hmm. it's more emotional, and it's more difficult, yet even as it's more critical to your business than ever before. So I see things getting more aggressive in this environment, more complex, and actually more crucial to business as we look at it. I don't know. Rick, would you concur with the views of our first two panelists? Yeah, absolutely, and I'd introduce uh, maybe a, an expansion of a, a factor that both uh, alluded to is uh, the power dynamic traditionally has resided either in the public sector in, in government or in the private sector to self-regulate um, in things like contracts and, and business interactions. But the power of, uh, of the public to have an immediate impact via social media or any of the other many ways that you can very rapidly spread a thought, a concept, a photo, an act, um, has dramatically changed uh, how we have to look at these issues around regulation. And uh, this, to me, is the, is the greatest challenge we're facing because it is utterly beyond the control of any individual company, any individual organization, probably ultimately uh, outside of China, any public institution. So. Mm. so would you say, would all of you say that the regulatory environment nowadays, compared with five years ago or even ten years ago, is a very, very different beast? You're dealing with a very different situation. You know, I could give you a couple of examples. You want to talk about beasts. Uh, could I have one of those uh, slides up, uh, that I brought? I brought a couple of slides. About a year or two ago, there was a headline in uh, a couple of different publications that drinking coffee can cause you to lose your hearing. So I know we have a lot of coffee drinkers here. Drinking coffee can cause you to lose your hearing, or that's what the headline said. This is exactly the type of thing that you're alluding to. Mm -hmm. There's a headline like this, and you think about this for a second. Uh, in America, there are 35 million people who are hard of hearing. So a headline like, uh, like this, as we say, goes viral. So what does industry do? What do we do? Well, the first thing we did was we went to look at where that headline came from. So there's a research paper done by a couple of Canadians. Now, normally, I find Canadians to be very reasonable people. But they seemingly went off here a bit, and they did a bit of research that ended up in headlines all across the country. And this is what the research said. And they took 24 female albino guinea pigs, and they intravenously fed them coffee, the equivalent of a couple dozen cups of coffee. And at the end of this, they broke the guinea pigs up into three different groups. And one of them they left alone. That was the control group. The other one they shouted at, and the third one they shouted at some more to see if the guinea pigs were reacting. Well, I don't know about you, but if somebody intravenously fed me two dozen cups of coffee, I'd be not listening to anything anybody had to say at all. But this turned itself into a headline that got picked up in social media, and this is exactly the type of thing that triggers industry scrutiny by regulators. What are we doing to protect our children from hearing loss from coffee? 
unless you're an albino guinea pig, you shouldn't worry about this too much, honestly. <laughs> hey, right? So what does industry do? And that's the question we're really asking ourselves. Yeah. Right? In the old days, uh, I've been doing this for almost 30 years. In the old days, we would have screamed about this. We would have said it's a lot of nonsense. And then you would have had two opposing points of view. The public is naturally skeptical about industry. Anytime we say something, the immediate supposition is, well, you're industry. Of course you're going to say that. So we've got to change how we deal with these types of things. So the way to deal with this is to simply shed light on what happened and say, hey, have you heard about this? Have you heard that coffee causes you to lose your hearing? Well, gosh, look behind the headlines. See what's happening. And in that way, we can engage in the process and influence it or shape it. I'll give you one more example. Um, this is a very tragic example. A couple of years ago, powdered caffeine was available uh, without regulation on sale uh, in the U.S. market. A couple of teenagers purchased powdered caffeine. They're thinking they know all about caffeine. A cup of coffee is good for me. A teaspoon of powdered caffeine is probably really good for me. And they killed themselves. This is absolutely tragic. The uproar that resulted from this really provided a recognition for everybody that people had no idea what this stuff was. They had no idea how it compared to everything else. And it triggered an inquiry from Congress and an investigation by the FDA, the regulator in the US. The likely outcome of something like this is that we end up with a warning on coffee cups. And that was actually being discussed. I want you to think about that for a second. Caffeine warnings on coffee cups, right? Don't a lot of people drink coffee? I think people would say, I hope there's caffeine in my coffee, okay? But now as a practical matter, this is like labeling a pizza. How much caffeine's in your cup of coffee if you have to label it? Is, is there an espresso in there, two shots of espresso? Is it a decaf in there? Can you imagine turning your branding into a warning statement that looks like a Rubik's Cube? with 25 different potential combinations of caffeine in here. So I think these are the types of things, that, that's the end of my slides, by the way. I think these are the types of things that we're seeing uh, uh, that we didn't see a couple years ago. Uh, 15, 20 years ago, we'd see these very boring uh, legislative processes. We'd see an inquiry. Now these things blow up almost overnight, uh, like the guinea pigs blew up. Yeah, fair enough. Um, Rick, Bill's described some uh, regulatory issues in the coffee market as a whole. Is the specialty market different in any way? Or are there other issues, maybe sustainability issues or farmer issues? or What are the issues that affect you guys? Yeah, so <clears throat> at every level when we think about the regulatory environment for specialty coffee, um, we identified long ago that whatever the regulatory environment is for coffee in any given uh, uh, geography, um, that's the, regula the regulatory environment for all of coffee, including specialty coffee. And we've been successful in maintaining that outlook. Um, and the, the outcome of that has been for us to try to be active collaborators as the Specialty Coffee Association with a global stance. So uh, Bill can tell you with the, from experience, I'm likely to call Bill and say, Bill, what are you guys doing on this particular bit of activity and how can we support you? Um, and, uh, and, and Holger and I would have that same relationship if there was an issue there where we could add weight to the, to the German Coffee Association's position on something, we would be doing that. Because our look is that, that we are, whatever environment coffee's operating in, we're in, operating in. Mm. I would say that in terms of broad reputational risk in the things like the guinea pig studies and in the things like is coffee good for your health or is coffee part of a healthy lifestyle or can you be a coffee drinker and feel good about your impact on the planet. Here's a place where we have a chance to influence this sort of um, reputational regulation, if you will. Yeah. Okay, you raised the, the point about the NGOs and how active they are now, but are there other bodies out there that you think are also influencing the environment, like the EU, <laughs> other international bodies? Is it the NGOs, which are the new players in the market? Well, so other? far, when, when we uh, look on the political agenda, um, it's all about immigration these days. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we have uh, in October a hearing regarding the plastics. Uh, this will uh, come in the next years, probably very strongly, mm -hmm. um, on the political agenda, but not in, in the short term. Um, we will uh, have on the political agenda for sure 
the responsibility for the European companies for all the upstream value chain. Mm -hmm. So any company based in Europe will be responsible for whatever is happening in the producing countries. This will uh, for sure come up. Uh, we see this already uh, with the uh, activity by the European Union uh, regarding human rights. This is only the beginning of an uh, intensive discussion we will have. Yes. Um, so there are several uh, uh, topics ahead. Um, this is not everything is bad for the industry. Um, uh, when we see uh, 20 years ago, it was regulated uh, what you can claim is organic. Mm -hmm. um, today, this is in uh, European uh, legislation. Uh, what is not yet regulated at all is the claim fair trade. Is, has this coffee been fair traded? Everyone can use this claim. Whatever happened before, whatever salary was paid or price or the working conditions for the farmer. So on this particular, I would say we are waiting that there comes up a regulation because it's pro it protects the truthful acting companies. Uh, regulation is not always uh, seeing negatively. Uh, it, uh, mainly it protects uh, the truthful companies. Mm. Um, Obviously, uh, it costs overheads, uh, and oh. uh, not every company is willing to take these overheads. Yes. But uh, every company is affected equally yes. uh, by, by the law. So um, we are facing some serious issues. Uh, what, uh, what will not come in the next years, uh, I think, is uh, um, a minimum price uh, for the uh, green coffee. I mean, this has been discussed uh, in particular in the last uh, days and weeks uh, all over. And uh, the German Ministry of uh, Developing Aid uh, has, a uh, has put on the table a suggestion that the German coffee tax, which uh, is 1 billion euro per year, uh, should be used for supporting fair traded sustainable coffee, whatever this might be. Uh, and uh, when we know the study of SCA or the coffee barometer, uh, in these days uh, per year, $350 million are spent uh, for uh, sustainable activities, projects in the coffee business. $350 million. And the German minister would like to put on the table $1 billion per year. Not sure that this will come. Um, also, uh, it's a very, uh, uh, it was a statement uh, done in the press on uh, the Easter Sunday when every German reads the newspaper. So it was a very public uh, statement uh, so far without any concept in the background. But uh, um, since coffee is the most consumed beverage in Europe, every NGO and every politician tries to put their agenda regarding the coffee because uh, it has the most uh, rate of consumption of any food and beverage uh, in Europe. Yes. That's a perfect tool uh, to raise any uh, political agenda. Yes. Bill, Rick, um, Holger raised an interesting point about regulation when he was talking about uh, trying to regulate what happens outside your country and regulating in your supply chain. Things like, is there slave labor in your supply chain? Uh, things like FIS FISMA, I think, the Food Safety Modernization Act. Can you tell us a bit more about that and how you see it affecting companies and the burden of regulation on them? Do you think it's going to be a big issue? You know, it's an issue right now. There's a couple pieces of uh, legislation that have been passed and implemented. Um, one is the Trade Enforcement and Trade Facilitation Act about two years ago. This um, it, it's a complicated legislative history, but here's what it amounts to. It makes U.S. companies responsible for the treatment of all the labor all the way back to their supply chain. Certainly, everyone I work with, they want to protect their brand, but more importantly, they want to do the right thing. These are people, they meet farmers, they get out to the field, they talk to folks. This is not a person I've met, at, and I meet hundreds of industry people who is cynical or wants to disregard this or dismiss it. The difficulty is really twofold. One is whether this is the right way to go about this, to make companies thousands of miles away don't have visibility into the supply chain responsible for things that should be handled by host country governments. And second, as a practical matter, whether or not this can be done. Mm. When, when coffee is collected and then resorted and resorted and resorted, and there's a container sitting on the dock in New York, for the government to ask where every little bit of that came from mm. 
And it has to have some sort of valid certification that this part came from here and that part came from there. Mm -hmm. That's a, a near impossibility, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. So people are working on this. They're certainly working to endeavor to, to comply with this. They're concerned about it. But there are real questions about, first of all, whether it's the right way to go about this, mm -hmm. whether combining this with some sort of government-to-government -government bilateral discussion and support might be more appropriate. Yeah. And second, whether it can be done. Then there's the food safety question. Mm -hmm. Same type of issue. This is really a fundamental shift in looking at food safety. Uh, previously, what we used to do in the US, after people got sick, we went out and conducted an investigation. And six months, eight months afterwards, we'd figure out who got sick, why, long after the issue was over. The idea now is to proactively go in your supply chain and verify upstream what the risks are and how they're being handled. Mm -hmm. But again, our regulators, and I think this is perhaps somewhat unique to the U.S., they took a particularly U.S. perspective. We're often accused of, of, of this. And there are questions, you know, do the, do the workers in the warehouse have a hairnet? Are they wearing a uniform? You know, as somebody said to me, my, my folks aren't wearing shoes. They don't, you know, they're lucky if they have a shirt on, and this doesn't affect coffee. Yeah. And you have to be understanding of where this is. So for a bureaucrat in Washington to look at this, have a checklist, and say, you've got to do this, this, and this, applying standards that you might be applying in North Carolina or Louisiana, mm -hmm. there's a disconnect. Mm -hmm. So this is, again, an example of why industry needs to be in that discussion, mm -hmm. to raise these points and to see what sort of practical solutions can be reached. Yeah. Rick, what's your perspective on how far a company can really be expected to reach down its supply chain to address these issues? It, it, I like to sort of try to get as much altitude on that question as one can, and Bill alluded to this. You know, there's a bunch of good folks in this room and in this business and in this world, and, and one of the things we love about our industry is that, by and large, we like the people in it, and that extends to all the people in it. And I can tell you that... Um, when I try to get that perspective, I try to get to the place of what would I hold myself to personally mm. and how I would act in the world and start from there. And I'll tell you a failing that occurred for me personally. I spent a lot of time beating the drum about farmer livelihoods and uh, how we as, as buyers of coffee were um, impacting the livelihoods of farmers. And I, I had that conversation on an ongoing basis for a dozen years until somebody came to me and said, what about on-farm labor? You are talking about smallholder farmers who own a parcel of land and are working on their own parcel of land, but there are millions of people who are not landowners or who are casual labor on somebody else's land as well as their own. What are you doing for them? And it occurred to me that well-intentioned as I was and as much as I wanted to do the right thing, I had never given that a moment's consideration. And so this is a very long-winded way of saying, ultimately, I think each of us as an individual has to be fully responsible as far as we can stretch ourselves. Mm. I also think I have to be responsible for my own health, but I haven't always done that every day to the fullest extent that's possible. So trying to understand how to make the desired outcome and the desired p position match to the realities of our lives um, is where the rubber meets the road. And I think the conversation needs to be in the public sector with rational actors and not in the public sphere with irrational claims. Yeah. So, yeah, I want to do the right thing, and I think getting to the right thing is an important objective, and understanding what it is is important, and there's room for regulation in here. But there's no sense in making regulation that nobody can comply with and just hope it'll get better. Sure. Holger, you mentioned plastics earlier, and there's a lot of talk in the UK, there's a lot of talk in Europe about plastics, about sustainable packaging. Is that the next wave of regulatory development that you foresee? Is that something that's going to affect the industry in future? Uh, this is a general topic which affects uh, every branch, uh, not only coffee in particular. Um, but uh, this is a very good example where uh, why this topic is also mainly driven by N NGOs. Uh, if we see the regular packaging of a roast and ground vacuum pack, three layer foil, that's never in, in the public discussion. Mm -hmm. But if you have a single plastic product, like the plastic capsule, mm -hmm. that's in the newspaper and the TV reports. 
So this plastic is much easier for recycle of the capsule than the other four. But uh, the story is too complicated for the NGO. So they pick out the uh, capsule as a single portion and they claim it uh, for the waste. Sure. They claim again that uh, they're asking and demanding for the compostable capsules and they don't want to hear, they don't want to understand that there's no solution at the moment available that the capsule can be made from uh, plastics which is compostable and has at the same time the perfect oxygen barrier. So, but you, you see, it takes me five sentences to explain and the NGO writes uh, uh, on Twitter, on social media, one sentence. Mm. So we are always ahead in our arguments. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't matter if the arguments are factual, if they are scientific, they are too long, too complicated. And uh, unfortunately, we see that uh, politics follows in the last years uh, mainly these uh, demands of NGOs because uh, also politics has become more complex. And uh, the, so the politicians are looking to provide for the voters some or any easy action that they can claim for the next election, I have done for you as a voter, as a human being in my district to save the environment, we have banned plastic in what way? So um, it's, it's very easy for politics in these days uh, to pretend doing something good for the voters mm -hmm. by uh, putting plastic in general in, in the dirty corner. I, I think that's an excellent point. I, I like the way in particular you're looking behind. What is happening? What are the motivations? I was talking earlier about how this is a team out of four. What are the rules? But the fact is it's an ongoing battle. Why are NGOs doing this? They're using this to raise money. Why is there a headline about guinea pigs and coffee for clickbait to sell advertising, to get people to look at that advertising? Why are politicians doing this? They're doing it because it distracts from the issues. They're doing it for the same reason that Spain is disinterring Franco and putting him someplace else because unemployment is 20% and, and they don't want to deal with that. So let's talk about this thing over here. So I think one needs to be, um, I wouldn't say cynical, but I think look behind what the headlines say, what the organizations are doing, what the politicians are saying, and look at the real motivations that are out there. And the fact is they're an attack on your business very often for these ulterior purposes. Fair enough. Um, I wondered if we could also talk about another important form of regulation, and that's regulation by the clients of coffee companies. We all have clients in some shape or form. Uh, the, the regulation might cover the level of emissions from a roaster or the residual uh, limits for chemicals in a product. It seems to me that clients are asking for more and more information. They want that information almost in real time. Would you agree that coffee companies themselves are actually driving demand for regulation? Yeah, it's not only the coffee companies in particular. I think what, what drives us mad is uh, that uh, uh, laboratories um, can find deeper and even smaller uh, amounts of any residue or any pesticide. Mm. So what five years ago was a perfect coffee was absolutely clean is today claimed as too many pesticides, herbicides, glyphosate, whatever you call it. And um, all this nasty uh, uh, stuff is seen as an individual compound. Mm. Like acrylamide. So, yeah. for acrylamide, for example. Um, so, of course, when you give the rats or the, the mouses uh, any particular stuff, they will suffer. But if you take them, give them the coffee, then the effect is positively. But the uh, regulators, and then following also, unfortunately, some of the coffee companies in the value chain, mm -hmm. only look on all these particular small components, and they want to regulate this one in a contract or by law. And they don't see coffee in this wonderful, beautiful, positive effect on the human body as a whole. So what, what really our job is, go out, tell to the media, to the legislator, to, uh, and all these uh, guys look at coffee as a whole, the holistic approach. That's very important, I think. I, I think uh, another aspect of that, and those are excellent points, in addition to the fact that the client itself is pushing the regulatory boundary, uh, as Hans mentioned earlier, 
It's the innovation they're looking for to serve the consumer. So, for example, uh, we're seeing, uh, we just saw an announcement the other day, Coke is talking about a cannabis-infused beverage. We're seeing this out of California, where marijuana is being legalized. So you have legislation, you have industry looking for opportunity, you then have innovation, but there's actually particularly uh, a particular vacuum around that type of product. Uh, marijuana infused coffee in California raises all kinds of issues. Mm -hmm. Sales to underage kids, uh, liability questions. It's not been studied like coffee has. So I think this innovation, it certainly can come pushed by clients, but ultimately they're responding to consumers. And that's again, back to social media trends, demographics and other aspects of sure. what's happening. Sure. Um, Rick and Bill, I'm wondering if we might talk about some regulatory success stories in the coffee sector. Uh, the issues you think the, the, the sector has handled particularly well. I'm thinking maybe of the way NCA worked over the last deca decade or so on coffee and health, demonstrating to the authorities and to the medical profession that coffee is good for us. Can you tell us a little bit how, how you went about that and what you think is achieved? Sure. I think it's important to say I don't think we're, we are where we need to be yet with coffee and health. I think we're in a much better place than we used to be. Uh, years ago uh, in America, if you went to a doctor for a physical, you would fill out a form. Uh, do you smoke? Do you drink hard liquor? Do you take recreational drugs? And do you drink coffee? It would be on the list. And there are reasons for that historical condition. People were smoking, drinking coffee. The fact is if you're a smoker, you metabolize caffeine much more quickly than non-smokers. So the researchers were looking at people who were smoking, drinking a lot of coffee, and concluding that there were unhealthy effects from the coffee. We've been able to parse that out. There are now literally thousands of studies uh, that show the healthy effects of coffee. And as we did with the guinea pigs, the way we've done this is really uh, unemotional, steady, fair, and objective. Look at this research, we'll say. We didn't pay for that research. Address the cynicism. Put it in English. This is what it says. And then be very careful. Don't say things like, coffee's good for you, if you're writing a story. So, a research has shown that this can have a beneficial effect on your liver. And that's accurate and to the point. So I think it's a question of repetition, of persistence, of uh, being objective, as being um, a truthful, objective, accurate intermediary, and that's how you get the message out there. But there's a lot of opportunity. We, we do research with consumers every year, and roughly one-third of consumers tell us that they limit their coffee consumption because they're worried about the health effects of coffee. Roughly 40% of consumers tell us they drink coffee when they want to drink a healthy beverage. So it's almost as if the public is a bit schizophrenic. Mm -hmm. One of the things we're actually uh, talking to our board of directors about is whether we want to undertake a more uh, direct and concerted effort to raise awareness about health benefits. Mm -hmm. We did some research this year. We asked people specific questions. If you knew that coffee was good to prevent liver cancer, would you drink more of it? Mm -hmm. When you put the question like that to somebody, they say yes. Yeah. So if we can take some of those messages, package them, and get them out, we might have a chance to increase consumption. Mm -hmm. And I think over the past day and a half, we've heard all about the knock-on effect of benefits of consumption, return the market to a more favorable price, benefit farmers everywhere, help folks all along the value chain. Yeah. So oh, if you think about this as a value chain, working at that end can really ripple throughout the whole thing. Yeah. But I guess you're coming up against the noise in social media and in the press. I should mention the press. The noise in the press where stories go around the world which are adverse, and then you need to counter them. So you must spend a lot of time doing that, both at SCA and in NCA. We do, and I, I will say, as a member of the press, we never see that issue with CCI. I mean, you guys are <laughs> deliberate. You're, uh, especially in the publication, you're long form. You're going to two pages, three pages. You're covering the story. But the thing is, if, if you go to Google and turn on Google's uh, auto search feature, and you start to type, Ken Coffee, and see what pops in. Mm. And here's what it's going to tell you. People, can coffee make you go to the bathroom? Can coffee give you gas? Can coffee make you blind? These are the things people are typing in, what they're looking for. Okay? So we still have a lot of work to do, yeah. and I would say we're maybe halfway there. Fair enough.
You, you asked about success stories, and this is one that I, I, is quite interesting in the same vein to me. And as Bill pointed out, medical professionals, not merely in the United States, but across the developed world, spent a couple of decades asking us to limit our coffee intake as a proxy for limiting our caffeine intake. And um, work that I think was initiated actually at the European Coffee Federation, but that was well embedded into the ICOs program, said, wait a minute, can we talk to doctors about this? Doctors are, doc medical professionals generally are these, say, 10,000 points of, of contact and each of them is talking to 100 patients and they're multiplying this. And when you ask medical professionals, why, um, can you show me any evidence? Do you have any evidence? Are there studies that have spurred your thinking here? And universally, they discovered that there were no yeah. such studies, that this was a, a, a meme, a trope that we had developed, things that we all know, right? Mm -hmm. Information that we all have from birth. Uh, and these kinds of, um, you know, the, the English vernacular, I guess, is old wives' tales, got embedded in the medical community yeah. somehow. And the response to that was saying, hey, we don't have to convince 100 million consumers that coffee's okay for you. Mm -hmm. We gotta convince 10,000 or 20,000 medical professionals, and that's achievable. And when you can, when you can reduce the thinking of that, saying who, who specifically do we need to talk to, yeah. then you've got an opportunity for sex, success like this one. And if we succeed with the Prop 65 issue, it's going to be because the scientific community, a relatively narrow band, yeah. was the audience, rather than because the massive band of the public was yeah. the audience. So talking about old wives' tales, Tell me more about Proposition 65. Where is it? I mean, where does it rest now? And perhaps for anybody who's not in the US, who's not followed it fully, what happened, why, and where have you got in tackling this issue? I'm going to give you the most macro view of Prop 65 and then let Bill give you the details. So the most macro issue is it's one of the most scathing indictments for the idea of a ballot proposition that has ever been created in the history of American uh, politics and legislation. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> That's the helicopter view. <laughs> so, uh, for, to, just to provide some overall perspective, uh, there's a particular uh, state law in California in the U.S. Uh, there was a movie years ago titled Aaron Brockovich. Aaron Brockovich was the story of a woman who uh, was led to believe that the groundwater, the drinking water in her neighborhood was contaminated. She went to law school, she fought this, and the outrage that resulted was that people should know if there are toxics in their neighborhood. So Prop 65, passed by a vote of the California public, says that if you're making available to the public something that is a known carcinogen, you need to put a label on it that says this product has something in it that is known in the state of California to cause cancer. Now, I used to live in California, ironically, I used to work in the movie industry, and the first time this pops up, it's absolutely horrifying. You walk into an office building, and there's a sign, warning, people are working with something in here that causes cancer. And then you ask the question, well, oh my gosh, what are you guys doing in here? What's happening? And they say, oh, it's the toner in the Xerox machine that causes cancer. Are you eating copy your toner here? What are you doing? <laughs> no, but the law doesn't say any of that. All the law says is if you might be exposed to it, there's got to be a warning. And so you fast forward this, and there's some other peculiarities. Private citizens can make money by bringing lawsuits if they think the law has not been enforced. So a private party brought a lawsuit about eight years ago. They sued coffee companies. And they said, there's a acrylamide in coffee. And we know that when acrylamide is fed to guinea pigs in very high doses, they get cancer. Therefore, you should put a cancer warning on coffee. The industry's been in court for uh, over eight years, spent somewhere between 10 and $15 million fighting this. In some cases, some smaller companies have settled just to be done with it. They put cancer warnings on them. Well, after years of study and years of review, both the Food and Drug Administration, the federal regulator, as well as the California regulator, has said, you know what? We think this should be an exception to the law. And here's why. And hold your mention this earlier. Because when you drink a cup of coffee, you're not drinking a cup of acrylamide. You're drinking coffee. And there's a difference between acrylamide and coffee. 
I think, Bill, you said this earlier. Acrylamide's full of, a co coffee is full of thousands of compounds. Acrylamide is one of them. And the research is perfectly clear. If you drink a lot of coffee, you're going to live longer. You're going to have reduced risks of certain type of cancers. So we're in this absurd situation where we're fighting a lawsuit requiring us to label coffee. About two weeks ago, about, I guess about two months ago, time passes quickly, the California regulator said we'd like to exempt coffee so there's no application of these cancer warnings. We thought we were making some progress, and I think we are. There's a lot of very good feedback. And about two weeks ago, the person who brought the original lawsuit to force coffee companies to put these labels on, he's filed an injunction in court, and he's trying to stop the whole exemption process from happening. So this is literally playing out day by day. Um, the only real winner here right now, quite frankly, are teams of lawyers who are making $900 an hour and fighting back and forth. But hopefully the momentum's on our side. Oh, yeah. And if we can get to where we need to be, I think the public relations, the publicity, mm -hmm. based upon the science, will really be invaluable. Rick, are you also hopeful? Are you fairly optimistic about this process still? Yeah, I, I, uh, I am more optimistic than I've ever been. I, am, uh, I should qualify that by stating up front that I am a fifth-generation Californian, uh, so uh, I, have, I feel some sense of personal responsibility <laughs> in this process. Um, having said that, I think uh, the greatest joy in this is not just a potential victory for coffee, but the potential victory for critical thinking. Mm -hmm. So the idea that we might, at a public sector level, apply sound principles of critical thinking combined with good data provided by science and reach an analysis and a conclusion that makes sense, the very fact that that's a possibility in our current public dialogue is the most optimistic thing I've heard all year. Aren't there also moves in Congress to uh, address labeling requirements for, for products, not just coffee? Yes. Uh, yes. Could, could those impact on this debate as well? I, I think they pushed the regulators in California to do what they wanted, what, what they did, because the regulators in California were afraid they were going to lose control to the federal authority. Right. And once that authority was lost, yeah. the whole system would be broken. So I think they picked coffee as sort of a, a poster child to say, look, we can be reasonable exactly as Rick said. Yeah. And, and I think to Rick's point, at a, at a moment where our country is denying that there's climate change and withdrawing from treaties, to see science uh, be the basis for public decision, I, I think Rick's exactly right. This could be a great, great move, not just for coffee. Let's hope so. And maybe as a, a counter for Proposition 65 as a whole? No, it won't move Proposition no? 65 in our lifetimes. But yeah. it, <laughs> so what will happen, we've had a conversation with other industries, mm -hmm. and other industries have uh, come in and said, that's really good. We'd like to know how you did that and how we can get one of those exemptions. Mm -hmm. And, and the well, answer there have been is other exemptions. Wasn't there any, no? Wasn't there a case of baked goods? The FDA saying something about there, there are a couple: tuna yeah. fish, mercury, and tuna yeah. fish baked goods. Mm. There have been a couple. You know, our answer to the other folks in the other industries has been: uh, we all have our trade secrets. So how it happened, we can't really talk about. But yeah. uh, on the other hand, um, you should try to get one of those. But you need to start with the science. To my friend Rick's point. Fair enough. So one last question to round off the session. How can bodies such as SCA, NCA, and the Café Verband respond in future? Do you guys collaborate? Is there sufficient collaboration between organizations such as yours and between countries to address these issues? So what do you think there's more that could be done in future? I, I would say my own outlook from the SCA perspective is that we have been relentless collaborators, uh, particularly with the NCA on this issue. We have every uh, intention and uh, we'll, we'll focus our energy on being collaborators with ECF, with the German Coffee Association, uh, with the Japanese uh, coffee associations, anywhere we can to say, hey, let's encourage rational thought. Let's encourage reasonable regulation and legislation. Let's uh, encourage... Um, bring the data and the science to bear on the issues that confront us. We're 100% collaborative in that front. Well, I, d I, do, I guess you guys do still face a situation where individual countries set their own limits and their own mm. regulation. Now, that's got to be difficult, hasn't it, really? 
Right. It's why it's my my opening statement. There is really we as a as a global uh, or globally footed organization. We really have to sort of um, be collaborative by nature because we can't be responsible for the legislative environment in any one given geopolitical domain. So we try to be collaborative with whoever's leading the charge within that, uh, that right. country. I, you know, I I think I would. I absolutely endorse what Rick says. We have a fantastic working relationship, and I'm very grateful. Rick's been in this business a lot longer than I have, and he's taught me a lot of things, and I appreciate that. I think a related question is, how can all the people in this room get interested and engaged? Yeah. Okay. I mean, we're working together. How can you guys work with us? Make sure you know who in your company is responsible for regulatory matters. In a big company, that's easy. You probably have six or eight people. As companies get smaller, that's not so obvious. Second thing is, what is your early warning system? How do you stay abreast of what's happening? Is it you read CCI? Do you subscribe to something else? Is there services out there? What are your eyes and ears? Third thing is, what are the tools that you have? It may be a trade association. It may be your chamber of commerce. It really depends on the issue. But make sure you're tracking this, because if not, you're going to wake up one day. The rules have changed completely. You're now tripping down the field, mm -hmm. running to the goal. Mm. And you're going to be wondering, how did that happen? Mm. And you shouldn't be there. Holger, the last word from you about that. The NGOs, but also the politicians, are uh, globally connected uh, perfectly. So uh, the industry is also uh, globally, we've seen the presentations of Starbucks and Lavazza's. So it, it's the same with the associations. The topics are the same in your markets, uh, are in China, in the US, in Europe. So we also... Uh, uh, are very well connected and uh, we are twice a month at least uh, content have you heard about that substance how do you do that do you have a statement for that one so that's perfectly well what what i'm afraid about is uh, the consequences of the Volkswagen diesel scandal because this affects uh, the trustful relation between industry and authorities mm -hmm. legislators Thank so you. Um, th there is uh, a lot of broken glass um, and uh, we had a uh, very trustful relationship to the ministries, to the authorities, and this has been affected by the scandal. So I would like to encourage uh, every association and every uh, company in particular in these days to be very open and cooperative with authorities. Thank you. So I guess the big picture is be, be proactive, get involved with you guys and the early warning system that you provide. Great. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I think that's been another excellent session with some excellent input. So if you wouldn't mind uh, thanking our excellent panellists in the usual way. Thank you. <laughs>